Hi, everyone. Logan Hertz here with Hazeltine LLC. I have with me again a returning guest, Mr. Anthony Rushing, who is sales manager at First Savings Bank, and he leads the team that does that specializes in the First Lean HELOC product. And he is himself an expert in First Lean HELOCs and velocity banking. Anthony, great to have you with us today. How are Thanks, you doing? Logan. I really, really appreciate it. I'm excited to chat with you today and, um, and um, talk a little bit about. Um, you know, the, the velocity banking concept, uh, we do it through our first thing HELOC, our first thing HELOC product here. Um, and, you know, talk with you a bit about um, maybe different ways that we can leverage that with, with other, you know, other strategies. Yeah. So um, we've got velocity banking with which Anthony's product enables you to do in a very efficient manner. Um, then we've got infinite banking, which is what I do. Uh, um, using whole life policies. And then we've got how you kind of, how they can be complementary strategies. And there's someone in the business who calls this infinite velocity. Okay. So, but so I, um, when I first started with it down this path in terms of velocity banking, um, I first learned about it, it, it as its own thing. Right. Uh, and then come to, to light, there's this other idea using a liquid, you know, a liquidity vehicle, uh, financial vehicle called infinite banking. And they were completely separate. Um, and the more I thought about it, I was like, wait a minute, like th there are a lot of similarities between these two. Um, and initially, uh, and this was probably six years ago, five years ago, something like that. Um, I talked with people and the idea was that both require, and we'll, we'll I'll explain velocity banking to anyone that isn't uh, sure about it or, or know about it. But but what happened is that they they both require this cash flow, right? Um, and they were initially seen as sort of competing ideas. And and I had I just want to say I never saw them as competing ideas. I just want to say that <laughs> but some people did. Some people did, and and that and and there was a general consensus when I would approach people. They said, "Yeah, but you know, we, we, you, they both require cash flow, so I don't want the cash flow messing with my stuff if they do your thing, right? And you know, if they're going to do all their cash flow over here, then they they don't have any money over here. So, but I remember I was I, I thought to myself, I was like, there's got to be a way to integrate the two, so there's a, a mutual benefit for both, so it creates a, a better outcome, and." Just recently, probably within the past year and a half, Logan and I started talking, and um, we were just throwing around different ideas and, and and checked it with numbers as well. And there's there's a way that you can integrate both. So so I think that's that's kind of what we fell into. But there was this initial assumption from a lot of people in in the industry and and I in both industries, but. Infinite banking at that point in time, and even now, is a lot bigger than velocity banking is in terms of understanding and knowledge. I would I would argue. Um, oh. So um, so it seemed like that they, that they did they couldn't be integrated together. But I was always of the mindset that there's got to be a way. I didn't know the int I didn't know the infinite banking side well enough to be able to put pen to paper. And so you know yeah. coming across you, Logan, and you know it's like one or two other people that actually have, have been able to figure this out. It's really pretty, pretty interesting. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, uh, to, to quote Caleb Gilliams, we're, we need to be thinking more in terms of and rather than, or because the faulty thinking behind that is either I can send my cash flow to this vehicle or I can send my cash flow to that vehicle. Well, what if you can do both with the same dollar? That's kind of the premise behind both infinite banking and velocity banking, that your dollars can be doing multiple things at the same time. So it doesn't have to be an either or scenario, right? And so, but with that segue, maybe Anthony, you can start us off with just a very basic explanation of yeah. velocity yeah. banking. So um, I'll walk, so, so velocity banking is a strategy um, that utilizes a, a line of credit. Um, to basically take advantage of, of the structure of an open-ended loan, open-ended line of credit. We do it with a first position HELOC, which is one big open-ended line of credit that's secured by your real estate. It's a mortgage product, comes in and pays off your mortgage. It assumes the mortgage balance. Um, 
Every dollar that goes into your HELOC, this line of credit, can also be taken out. So every dollar you put in here is liquid, right? It's different than with a mortgage. With a mortgage, with an amortized mortgage, all the money that goes in is locked away. You can't take it back out. So the fact that money can go in and out freely, this flow, this liquid flow of money allows for this whole strategy to be feasible. That's one of the of, of the structures or the, the, the rules, we'll call it, that we know and that we leverage to our benefit. Um, the second is how a HELOC calculates its interest. So, um, and I'm explaining these because in order to know the strategy, the strategy is based on how the loan works, right? So we have to understand how the loan works to be able to know how to use it, how to leverage it. So the, the second difference has, has to do um, with how it calculates its interest payment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the right first lien HELOC for this strategy. And I say it that way because I don't know how every bank in the whole world or the United States structures its first thing. They, they may, it may not, some may not do it, but in order for this strategy to be optimized, it has to calculate the interest using the average daily principal balance, which basically means that every single day has its own individual, uh, individual uh, balance that creates an interest cost, right? So every single day has its own interest cost. So what that means is that every day's balance matters because every day's balance results in a daily interest cost. And so if we think about it like that, if we want to create the lowest payment this month, we need to create the most days with the lowest balance because that results in the lowest interest cost, right? So you got 30 days in the month. Every single one of those days, you want to create the lowest balance possible for all those days, and that'll result in the lowest interest payment, right? It, it's really like that. That's that's an easy way to think of it. Most days, lowest balance. So um, that understanding of I need to create the most days with the lowest balance starts by creating the, as soon as you possibly can, create the lowest balance possible, right? So that understanding leads into the first part of the strategy, which is if I need to create the lowest balance as fast as I can, anytime I get money, all the money goes in the HELOC. Because when I put all the money in there, I can't create a lower balance. I've already created the lowest balance possible because everything I have is there. So how does that translate to, you know, day to day? When you receive your income, when people receive their income from a paycheck, it doesn't go into their checking account. It goes into their HELOC. It goes into this home loan, which sounds crazy because for most people, if you put your money into your home loan, it's locked away. You can't take it back out. And then you have to eat food and pay for things, right? And your money's locked away, right? Well, here, remember, money can go in and out freely. Every dollar we put in here, we can take out as well. So essentially, we're storing all of our money here. Um, we get paid, we put all of our money in here, and then we take out what we need to pay our bills. Well, all the money goes in that reduces our balance as much as possible. When we pull the money out with what for what we need, that increases our balance. So then the question is, at the end of the month, you've deposited all your money, that's your pay down. You've taken out what you need, that increases your balance. How much money went in with your income and how much money was taken out with your expenses? And so when this works, the household brings in a lot more income than what they spend. That's when this works. That's the only time this works. If a household brings in, and I'll use it, so it doesn't even have to do with the amount of income. If a household brings in $20,000 a month, and then their, their lifestyle requires a $20,000 spend every month, it would go down by 20 grand and go up by 20 grand and go down by 20 grand, with their income go up by 20 grand with their expenses. It wouldn't work for them. So it, it really, it, and I, I'll argue, it's probably easier to live below your means if you have, if for a household that is a higher income household because there's a basic cost of living that's just a reality. But this isn't just for people who make a lot of money. It's for, it's for people across the board who make more money than they spend or discipline with their finances. Because what that means is, if we simplify it, oversimplify, we'll call it, a lot of money goes in, pays down your balance, a little money comes out, which increases your balance. So you still have 
a lot of money left in there. So with this strategy, the only thing that ever pays off your house are the dollars that you don't spend. That's it. That's the only thing that ever pays off your house. Now I can spin that to make it sound better for, for my purposes, right? Uh, what that also means is so I'm, I'm gonna you know change the spin, say the same thing. That also means that every single dollar of your surplus is by default dedicated toward paying off your home because there's no money anywhere else and all your money is here, this is the fastest way for you to reduce debt yep. because everything you have is here. So that's yep. um, that's it, right? Money goes so, in, money comes yeah, out. What, what, what we're doing with velocity banking, which can utilize different tools, but in Anthony's case, it's a first lien HELOC on your primary residence. And in, in it's an automatic uh, option where your cash flow is now running through your HELOC instead of through a standard checking account. So all your money is paying down your balance. And of course, there can be more advanced use cases like refinancing higher interest rate debt into your HELOC and paying that down. So there's a lot of different ways it can be used. We're just trying to keep it basic for right. the purpose of this conversation. Yep. So that's Velocity Bank. Um, and that's what Anthony does uh, at First Savings Bank with the first thing HELOC. And as DeAndre Clayton said, if you're not doing Velocity Banking, there's really no reason to take out a first lien HELOC, right? Agreed. So, so what is infinite banking? So infinite banking shares some similarities with Velocity Banking, except the vehicle we're using is not a line of credit, but a specially designed whole life insurance policy, where instead of storing our capital, saving our money inside of a standard bank account, which is a single use vehicle, we're going to store our money inside of specially designed whole life insurance policies, which is a multiple use vehicle, right? So again, we're thinking in terms of and. So money comes into our whole life insurance policy. It's now earning for us inside the policy, tax-free with no market risk, right? Like a savings account. We have a death benefit, of course. That death benefit is important. It gives us legacy because it's a permanent death benefit. It gives us long-term care protection, protects our family, right? Um, and then as we pay into the policy and our cash balance accumulates, when we want to use that cash value, unlike a standard savings account, we don't have to withdraw it. If we did, it would just be a single use vehicle. It'd be like a savings account. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out a policy loan, meaning we're borrowing against the policy, right? And use that money however we plan to use it. Meanwhile, our full principal balance keeps earning for us inside the policy. And it's important to note, a policy loan is not a debt. There are no repayment terms on that loan whatsoever. So sometimes people in the infinite banking footprint will say, you're becoming your own banker. What they mean by that is when you take out this loan, nobody is dictating to you the terms of repayment on that loan. You are now your own banker. You decide what the repayment terms are, and you're going to pay it back in the way that's most strategic for you. And again, there are lots of different ways you can do this. We're just trying to keep it basic for the purposes of this uh, this video. Can but I go back to something you just said? Sure. Um, just so I can clarify to myself, right? And maybe to people that are watching. So, so what you're saying is if you fund a, let's say I fund, my cash value is 40,000 right now at this point in time. I fund a policy and at this very point in time, my my, my cash value is 40,000. If I do a policy loan of 30,000, right? Does ten thousand dollars still generate income, or is it interest income, or does that full forty thousand dollars that I first put in there still the, the generate full, the full forty thousand dollars? Even though working. you've already taken out, even though you've borrowed, we'll call it correct thirty thousand, right? So, so correct. You've, you've borrowed thirty thousand. You have thirty thousand dollars in a separate place. Yet, the full forty thousand dollars that you funded initially. At this point in time, in this scenario, is what would still be generating interest income. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. That's what we mean when we, when Caleb calls this the and asset. You can have your money working for you in whole life, and that same dollar can be doing something else, right? At the same time, so that is really what we're doing. And of course, the uh, the policy loan has no repayment terms. It's analogous to borrowing against real estate, right? If you're uh, a real estate investor, you buy a property with leverage, right? So you have a mortgage on that property. Okay, you're paying pre you're paying into the your mortgage payments are going into the property. As you're doing that, 
you're gaining equity from paying the mortgage and from the house going up in value, okay? You're also collecting rental income, right? Because it's an investment property, okay? As you build up substantial equity and you want to use that equity, well, real estate investors don't typically sell the house. They could, but then they would lose all the benefits of owning that house and they would have a taxable gain potentially, right? So instead what they do is they strategically leverage their borrow against them. So that property keeps earning for them. They're still benefiting from the capital appreciation in the property. They're still collecting the rental income and they've taken that equity and deployed it somewhere else, right? And they pay no taxes on that, of course, because they haven't realized a the gain. They've just taken out a loan and taking out a loan is not a taxable event. Not only do you pay no taxes on the loan, you can write off the interest on that loan if you're using it for investing purposes, right? Business or investing purposes. With whole life, we're doing something very similar, except we don't have market risk because we're not using real estate. We're using an asset that's guaranteed, right? Can't go down in value. And of course, we're not, um, we don't have the headaches of owning real estate, right? So we pay premiums into our whole life policy that grows the cash value. The cash value earns at a guaranteed rate. That's sort of like the capital appreciation, okay? And then we collect rental income. It's called a dividend, except instead of just collecting that dividend in a straight up income stream, we can actually reinvest it in quotes into the policy based on the way we structure the policy. So we get this nice compound interest curve, okay? When we want to use, uh, utilize the cash value in the policy, we don't withdraw it. We could, it's called a surrender. You can surrender some of your cash, but what we typically do is we take out a policy loan. So now the full principal balance keeps earning for us. We do not interrupt that compound interest curve, which is very powerful because compound interest gets better every single year, right? The total value of the house is that permanent death benefit. Our current equity in the house is the cash value. So the cash value is how much of that future death benefit is liquid and available to us today. And of course, we pay no taxes, right? There are no taxes on the gains because it's inside of a life insurance policy. There are no taxes on policy loans because, of course, you're borrowing. You're not uh, You're not realizing a taxable gain. So that, in a nutshell, is infinite banking. And of course, we're trying to keep it basic, but we've been rambling on quite a bit here. <laughs> um, now, Anthony, let's talk a little bit about how these two strategies can be complementary. Absolutely. So... Um... So we've got one strategy that uses a vehicle that's that's liquid and you drive all your income into it, use it to pay your bills. Sort of like your checking account. It's, it's, it becomes your centralized hub for how you uh, you deposit and spend money, right? For your for your family's day-to-day fine, you know, ex expenses, right? We have another vehicle here that um that you fund to create an amazing long-term option, we'll call it, right? Um, with, with death benefit and with the ability to borrow against it and with tax deferred or some, not necessarily tax free, but you know, very low tax income later on if you choose to use it that way as well, right? So it, it is tax free if you utilize it properly. Technically, you're right. The cash value grows tax deferred, but the only way it would be taxed would be is if you surrender. Fair enough. You're not recommending. Understood. Understood. So, um, so now the question is: Is there a way for us to to integrate these two different cash flow required strategies and vehicles in a way that's more beneficial than doing one by itself? Right. Um, and on the surface, the quick reaction would be no, right? Because this requires cash flow, this require, requires cash flow. The, the thing that I think is cool is that the infinite banking concept, um, part of it allows for you, from what I understand, right? P part of the whole strategy is that you can use the liquidity in your uh in your policy right for and use it as capital for good financial purposes correct right. while and it keeps earning for you in the policy yeah yes. exactly you, you take it out from here you use it and it, it yep. earned the, the full amount earns for you over here while you use the same dollars to earn for you over here and then you return it back right that's that's what i understand right so 
Then the question is, is there a way to accomplish the velocity banking strategy and infinite banking strategy at the same time? One thing I haven't hit on is, and you know, for anyone that's watching, you may already know the what velocity banking can do for people. When this strategy works for people, they pay off their homes extremely quickly. So our tagline is five to seven years, right? That's a tagline because that is within the average of our of what we see for our portfolio. That's just not the, the person. The person who introduced me to the program paid off their house in less than three years. And right. I still talk about how easy it was. And and we've got decent data that that shows a, a payoff time as well. From a long term standpoint, from full payoff, but also average pay down of people's homes year over year that support that same time time period. So it's not just some arbitrary marketing term. It does it does it roll off the tongue really well? Yes, like five seven years, great. But it's not some arbitrary number that we just came up with. It's it's based right. in in data when this works for people, right? Right. And so. Right. So you pay off your home really quickly. And when, you, when you're when you able to pay off the home that quickly, A, that gives you that, it helps people achieve this. Uh, I like to think of it as an American dream, right? Um, of paying off your house, A, before you die, but really before you retire, right? Um, I would call it the, that, that American dream to become debt-free before you retire is in line with, People that that a lot of times receive pensions because it's a fixed income for the rest of their lives. And if you get rid of this fixed cost, now your income can help you do a lot more in retirement, right? Um, with the with those types of, of um, annuity structure and, um, and pensions going away, people are more concerned about creating uh, income possibilities for themselves and using leveraging for that as compared to just becoming debt-free, but it helps you become debt-free. And if you do become debt-free really quickly or get your balance down to a, a certain place where it's so low, their interest cost is, is minimal, um, then you can save tons and tons. I mean, I'm talking tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in overall interest cost compared to a low rate amortized mortgage. Our Right, I mean, right now, and today is the 30th of, we're recording on the 30th of July, um, 2024. So today our rate is at like 8.8%, right? I say that because it's a variable rate product. And if anyone watches this a year from now, um, obviously because it's a variable rate, uh, interest rate, the rate will likely be different than what I'm talking about now. But we beat, that this strategy beats out 2.5, 2.8, amortized mortgages. When this works, we, we do that daily with the people that we talk with. And again, it has to work. You have to make enough money. You have to, no, 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 sorry. You have to cash flow well enough. For, and, and you have to have the financial discipline, right? Financial, financial discipline, discipline and the exactly. cash flow. For both of these strategies, those are the two most important things. Exactly, right. So, so now we're the, the, the other the only other thing I'll add is one of the things I do with my clients is I try to help them optimize and create cash flow they might not have today by optimizing spend recurring spending that they have and yep. other things like that. So, if you don't have the cash flow today, maybe we can help you get into a position where you do have the cash flow, right? By working, that's, that's great too. That's a really good point as well because there are ways to to restructure certain debts. We'll call it. There are ways to restructure certain, like you said, ongoing payments. There are ways to um, to consolidate debt in a way that the overall obligate monthly obligation is lower, which increases cash flow to, to make this work better, right? Um, and that's that's a great strategy to help people optimize this even more um, to help it, it work even better to run it faster, right? So then the question, so we were kind of going down this this idea of how do you, is there a way to integrate the two, right? And there is, right? There's a way to use these two together um, at the same time um, to be able to receive a much better overall outcome because you have the ability to aggressively pay off your home 
and the ability to pay to to fund or uh, create a life insurance policy that is um, that's extremely robust and can serve you uh, financially for a lot of different ways. Would make sense. Um, yep. So um, so all in all, it the the velocity banking integration with this uh, comes down to your deposit, you're driving all of your money into this HELOC. It's a debt tool, but all of your income is stored here, right? It's not stored in a savings account. It's not stored in a checking account. It's not stored in a place that represents your liquid funds as a positive representation, right? It's a reduction in debt, right? So what you do is you pull your money from the HELOC because your all of your money is stored in the HELOC, right? You pull your money from the HELOC to fund a life insurance policy. Right? And everything else you're doing. So and everything else you're doing, out, right? I just want to point out, this doesn't require any conscious change to your habits other than you switch checking account A that you're using today with checking account B with First Savings Bank tomorrow that's automatically linked to your HELOC. And you're not changing anything you're doing. Right. It's just behind the scenes, it's going through your HELOC, right? Yep, yep. So, um, so now what you've done is you've taken X amount of dollars and funded a life insurance policy. And, and some of the pushback I get sometimes has to do with the fact that you're pulling from a debt tool, right? Um, the reality though, is that all of your money is stored here. This is your storage bin that you pull from and you pull your money from this place to fund this. It does happen to be a debt tool, but we're storing our liquid funds in a place that is uh, financially um, strategic, right? Mm -hmm. And it benefits us to do that. So we pull from this to fund our policy. <laughs> now, in my vacuum world, we then pull everything we possibly can from the policy and put it back on the HELOC. So essentially, if it's, I don't, uh, look, we'll use 10,000, right? If I fund a $10,000 annual policy, right? I then pull out as much as I can, let's say 9,000 from my policy. And I do a policy loan from the policy and I put it back into the HELOC that pays down the HELOC by 9,000, right? That's one way to get this done, right? Some people would argue that that is risky right? Because you're maxing out the loan that you're taking from the policy and put it back in the HELOC. From a first lien HELOC vacuum um, uh, philosophy standpoint, right? Um, if the purpose is to pay off your home as fast as possible, right? With this integration, that's the way that you'd accomplish that, right? So, and I, I say it that way because I'm not one to advise on whether you do that or not, right? I'm not one to say, hey, you should fund this and then you should borrow everything back and put it in the HELOC, right? That's not the purpose of, of this conversation here. For me, it's more about when we integrate these two, right? If we're going to implement velocity banking to pay off the house really quickly, and at the same time, use those same dollars to fund a life insurance policy that's extremely robust, right? From my viewpoint as a as a um, first lien HELOC idealist, right, uh, or absolutist, mm -hmm. we'll call it, right. Um, mm -hmm. what to do that would be to leverage the insurance policy to accomplish velocity banking, and you still create the policy, right? Right. That that fr from my angle, we'll call it, right. Being a first lien HELOC. You know, um, I'm biased, right, for that, mm -hmm. that particular strategy, right? That accomplishes the velocity banking strategy as well as possible if you do a max loan from the policy, right? You pay down the yep. HELOC, pay down the HELOC, pay down the HELOC. Well, now your premium comes, right? Well, you're paying down the HELOC with your money, right? So now right. you take your money from the HELOC to fund the policy, pull from the policy, put it back in the HELOC. Pay it down, pay it down, pay it down, pay it down using your money. You take your money back out from the HELOC. You put it in the policy the next year, pull from the policy, put it in the HELOC. 
And then at that point, there's a certain point where your home is completely paid off, right? Mm -hmm. At that point in time, whether it's three, five, seven, 12 years, right? Your home is paid off and you've also been able to create a life insurance policy as well, instead of just paying off the house quickly, right? Right, right. So the way I view it is um, if, if you just want to pay off your house as fast as possible and that's your only goal, then it probably wouldn't make sense to bring infinite banking into the picture at all. If you bring in infant banking, what you're doing is you're adding a cost because the whole life has a cost. But to your point, the premium level does not equate to the net cost to you, right? Because when you pay that first $10,000 premium in your policy, you're going to have a certain amount of cash value available to you. It won't be $10,000, right? And eventually you'll get to the point where every dollar you're paying into your policy is resulting in more than a dollar of cash value growth. And then we get to escape velocity, pun intended. Um, so what you what you end up doing though is 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 you you so if you have toxic debt, you probably want to pay off that debt using velocity banking first, if you're able to, before we talk about infinite banking. If you have non-toxic debt and you're comfortable with where you are in your, your home payoff schedule, right? Then we're going to actually slow down the home payoff a bit to do infinite banking, right? Because when we do pay off the house, now we're going to be in a much better situation. Instead of just having a paid off house, mm -hmm. we're going to have a paid off house and we're going to have a really nice cash flowing asset and whole life insurance. And why is this so important? Because the most important element in whole life is the passage of time. If you can start your whole life policy even one year early, it can make a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did a, a video, I'll probably link it below on the cost of waiting. And in one example, waiting one year resulted in hundreds of thousands of dollars less in retirement income from your whole life policy. And we're not talking about a huge whole life policy, right? So that's why I think it makes a lot of sense because yes, you are going to slow down your debt payoff in the near term, but in the long term, the benefits you're going to get from that whole life policy is going to massively outweigh um, the benefit of paying off non-toxic debt faster, right? Mm -hmm. If you have yep. toxic debt with you know really high interest rates and things like that, it's maybe it may be a different story. But what you end up with is what's the end game here? Well, you're going to have two strategic pools of liquidity. One in your home equity and one in your whole life policies. And for the average person, those are the, you're going to get the best access to capital from those two vehicles, right? Yep. Policy loan obviously has no repayment terms. It's not a debt. It's phenomenal. You can, it's a contractual right. You can take it out anytime you want. Meanwhile, your full cash value keeps earning for you. And then when you look at home equity in your primary house, if you go to any bank, you're probably going to get the best borrowing terms if you're borrowing against your primary house, especially if the bank is in first position on that house. And then again, we're trying to keep it basic here. The possibilities are endless, right? I mean, the possibilities are endless. There's not one way to use this. That's the beauty of it, right? Yep. You can use this system however you like, whatever makes sense for you. And it will open up new possibilities because now you'll have these two phenomenal financing tools. Yep. Right. Yep. Now that's great. And, you know, the, the important thing to remember is that the benefits that you get from this are true when the velocity banking strategy works, when you cash flow well enough to pay off the home quickly, you can, you don't just have to do that. You can also at the same time, create this other uh, amazing financial vehicle at the same time while still being able to pay off your home quickly. Now, you know, Logan, you mentioned that you you have to, you pay off your home slower, right? So if, if I'm looking at a seven year payoff without introducing a, um, you know, life insurance policy, right? If you were, and this is just sort of the theory of how the math works. If you were to borrow from the HELOC, to fund the policy and then max borrow from the policy and put it back in the HELOC. You're not sacrificing that much cash flow where it's really going to affect. I mean, it, it depends on the policy and how much you can borrow, but 
But in terms of, of the opportunity cost of doing that, um, generally speaking, what we find is that it doesn't increase that much time in terms of the payoff piece, right? It doesn't add 20 years to your payoff. It adds a few years, right? So you sacrifice a few years of your payoff time to be able to create an extremely robust secondary, well, it actually be it, it it eventually ends up being your primary financial vehicle, but uh, but you create this life insurance policy at the same time, right? Um, if you didn't want, if you didn't feel comfortable borrowing the max amount back from the insurance to a HELOC, right? Well, that's going to affect the payoff time with for the HELOC more, right? So it'll be an, a slower payoff time than had you done the max borrow from the insurance company here. And part of, of, of what I imagined Logan would, would do and what I would do in these types of conversations is to run different scenarios, right? Are you okay doing the max loan amount from your insurance policy or not, right? If you're not, how does that affect the HELOC? How does that affect your payoff with the velocity banking? And are you okay with that, right? Is that something that you're good with? Because a lot of, you know, when we're talking about uh, different variables, we'll call it, different uh, factors that affect things in different ways, uh, there's going to be a give and take that when you have people that know how to run the numbers and help you understand what, how to manage it to achieve a certain goal, then the question is, what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? What's your priority, Right. And we can help you structure this in a way. And again, the cash flow has got to be there, right? But as long as the cash flow is there, then the question is, what's your risk tolerance level? And then how quickly do you want to pay off the house? And which one of those is your priority? You know, what sort of interest cost is that going to result in? These are all things that, that when you're working with people that know how to move this lever and we understand what it does to this lever, now you've got someone who can align a strategy with your particular goals in mind and your particular risk threshold in mind. So, you know, the, the idea of borrowing everything from the policy and putting in the HELOC, yeah, that's great if, if we live in a first in HELOC bubble, right? And if that's what you want to do, right? And you're okay with, with that strategy, then that's that would be the one that would make sense for that particular risk threshold and that particular goal, right? Well, if you're not comfortable with that, and we have to, instead of paying off our home, in you know seven years, we paid off in eleven, right? But we don't have to borrow the max amount from the insurance policy, or maybe borrow anything from the insurance policy, right? Is that trade off okay? Are you okay yeah. with the trade off? And if you're okay with the trade off, then that's the right path for you, right? And so a lot of it is just understanding when we turn this lever, when we turn this off, what happens over here, and and is are you okay with that? And if you are, then that's the right path for you. And if you're not okay with it, then, okay, we tighten this lever, we open this lever up. That's going to have a benefit and an unintended, well, and, and, a, and a consequence, we'll call it, right? Are you okay with, with that reality? And then if that, if you're okay with that, then that's the path for you, right? So I think for any, for anyone that is listening to this, it's, it's the, the idea is less about, Hey, this is the right structure. That's not what this is. Um, it's more about, Hey, this is this is available, and there's a way that that you can achieve both at the same time. You got to sacrifice a little bit of one to get the other, right? It's it's kind of a back and forth, but that sacrifice can result in an overall outcome that is so much better because now you've got two liquid vehicles that you can leverage if you want, if you want or not, right? One is a liquid vehicle with your house that's secured by your real estate, which is extremely secure. The other is a life insurance policy that is more obscure, but it's it's from what I understand, it, it's one of the safest, if not the safest, financial vehicles that's available as well. Right. It's I think, guaranteed to go up in value, right? unlike so your house, the, which is hopefully appreciates in value, but is not guaranteed to go up in value. Right. So the insurance policy piece, I think, is is abstract, which makes it hard. It, it's not as tangible than pay off your home really fast, right? But, right, right. And well, so my, that, and my experience has been, um, I like what Denzel Rodriguez says, kind of, it's almost like velocity banking is sort of pre-work. 
Because as you do velocity banking, the way it changes your mindset makes you much more able to understand infinite banking. You're like, yep. okay, we're just taking this to the next logical conclusion and using and doing a similar strategy with a different vehicle, yep. right? Where instead of paying off debt, we are building cash, right? It's sort of the inverse of paying off debt. And you want to do both, obviously. Yep. You want to pay off debt and you want to build capital. And I love what you're talking, you talk about changing all these levers. That's just illustrating how much control this gives us. That's right. To me, this comes down to control. You are building two strategic pools of liquidity, like you said, both of which are appreciating in value. And now you have control over your financing decisions. Ultimately, as we would say in the infinite banking concept, you're reclaiming the banking function for yourself. Yep. So now you can kind of decide what makes most sense in terms of where you're running your cash flow and how you're financing everything you're doing in your personal economy, right? Yep. So it comes, so the numbers, we do want to look at the numbers, but I always like to emphasize the intangible benefits of doing velocity banking and infinite banking. And the number one in my mind is control. You now have control over your capital in a way that you probably never have before. And it really takes time doing it to start to appreciate how important that is. It's yeah. not about chasing return on investment. That's not what it's about. It's about cash flow, right? And it's about control. Wealthy people and savvy investors, they will happily give up some return to get more control and get more optionality, right? They'll happily do that all day long, all yeah. day long. Yeah. Because when we're talking about, there's another rabbit hole, when we're talking about return on investment, we're automatically locked into, let me lock my money up in one vehicle and earn a return, right? right. We're not locking our money up here. We're freeing it up via velocity banking and infinite banking so we yep. can use the money multiple times while Absolutely. it keeps benefiting from us in terms of the capital the um, capital appreciation in our house the pay down of debt and the appreciation in our whole life policy not to mention that permanent death benefit protection which is extremely important the long term care benefits critical and chronic illness protection etc yeah, exactly. So that was a very basic introduction to this topic. There's a lot more we could talk about here, but again, there's not one way to use this. That's right. right. It's only That's limited right. by your imagination, right? Absolutely. And and I, I like the fact that you mentioned the control piece. The control comes with understanding how they work and understanding that when you move one thing on one side, it's going to affect other things as well. Because this isn't just a an A B, it's not an A B type of strategy, right? It's not in out in out. There are multiple things that happen, and so uh, being able to control this requires an understanding of the holistic picture, which you can help with, Logan. I can help with the velocity banking side. You obviously you can help with the infinite banking side to understand um, if someone wants to learn more about this or is interested in, in seeing if it'll be a good fit for them. A lot of the, the initial questions are going to be, what are you trying to achieve? Right. What's the goal? Um, you know, and then in terms of, um, with different structures, are you comfortable with this? If this happens, right. Are you comfortable with this? If this happens, right. And aligning all those things together. But a lot of that just comes down to understanding the ins and outs um, uh, of when, you know, when you turn change one thing, how does it affect other things and making sure that whoever moves forward with or learns about this, right, is creating it a way that does best help them achieve their goals. Um, so that's, that's to me, what's pretty exciting about this too. Excellent. Well, we'll do a lot more content on this because this is a huge topic to explore, but we're right. talking about infinite banking and velocity banking and how we can combine the two to have a great overall complementary strategy. We've been talking with Anthony Rushing, the First Lean HELOC guy at First Savings Bank. Anthony, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Logan. Take care.